T-H-R-I-S-T-L-Y-M-E-R slash laptop underscore honeypots. It's chrisclimber.com slash laptop underscore honeypots. That'll work if you got a laptop. Um, the concept here, I guess I'll have to be a lot more brief. The whole idea behind this talk was basically <coughs> me realizing that securing your laptop the way I was going about it, and most of us go about it, is kind of dumb. You spend, all, you spend a lot of time setting really difficult to crack passwords, encrypting your partitions on your hard drive, um, doing all kinds of things to protect the data that's on your, your drive. And if you were to, say, leave your laptop lying out here and some unscrupulous person picked it up and ran off with it, they, um, they probably aren't going to care that much about the data that's on it. They care about the money they can get out of the laptop. So all the time you've spent securing whatever you had on it, doesn't get you your laptop back. Basically, you're screwed. So, I started, I, I, I've read a few articles about people that kind of through chance were able to get their laptop back. Uh, a guy, stroke of luck, had Timbuktu running on his laptop and managed to catch the guy going online through a dial-up connection get back into his computer over that, see the phone number the guy was calling from, and actually tracked him down and got his laptop back because of that. Incredibly, incredibly lucky, but what if we could do something to make luck go a little more our way? So the idea is basically, I don't want the thief to wipe my laptop. I want him to use it. I want to keep him using it, look around, you know, if, if a thief boots up my Linux laptop and sees what looks to him like DOS and a password that, you know, he can't just hit enter and go through and, and get to Windows, yeah, he's not going to bother messing around to figure out how to get through it. He's going to just wipe it. If you got physical access, it's, it's, you know, trivial. So what we're going to do, we can have all that security on our actual data if we want, but we want, it, we want the thief to make, he's, make him think he's using something a lot less secure. So what we're going to do is give him Windows. I'm not running Windows, but I'm going to give the thief Windows. I'm going to give him Windows full of all kinds of goodies. Fill, you know, be creative, fill it up with text files, with fake financial documents, fake users and passwords. Uh, maybe even for kicks, set up some Hotmail accounts and Gmail accounts and have actual users and passwords for those on the desktop there for him to dig around with. Install a bunch of software that looks attractive to him. Basically anything I can do to make him hopefully get on the internet from the machine and just spend as much time as possible on it. The way that we're going to find him and make this worth our while one, the OS we're giving them, it's not really our OS. We're going to run Windows in emulation on top of Linux. We're going to make him not know that we're running Windows in emulation on top of Linux. And we're going to watch everything he's doing from underneath. We're going to watch, for our Linux install is going to watch what he's doing in Windows the whole time. If you're looking at slides, I have a nice picture of basically what's going on. There will be, you have your machine, within it you're going to partition, you have your, your regular Linux partition, and we're going to create a really slim Linux install. <coughs> All this Linux install needs to do is be able to run the QMU emulation software and be able to run whatever tools you want to watch them with. You know, editor cap, 
um, uh, snort, whatever you choose to use to track what he's doing, you know, and that's, that's left up to you. There's plenty of, plenty of different things out there you can watch network traffic and so on with. Um, you know, and, and you know, your basic Unix tools to, you know, shell script this. The big things we're using here in, in combination are some unique things with the Grub bootloader, with the Linux boot, slash project, boot splash project, and the QMU emulation software, and, and basic Unix shell scripting. And oh, the the um, the second partition, the slim one I just mentioned that you're going to run QMU in, it needs to be just big enough for your slim Linux install for whatever you're going to watch your attacker with and for whatever you're going to have within Windows on that slim partition. Basically, when the attacker gets your, mach their, your machine, this is what's going to boot up. It's not going to touch your actual partition with all your real data in it at all. And part of how we keep them from knowing what's going on is Grub. Um, it's not officially part of Grub, but most distros have it. Debian, I know, has it. Um, several others likely do as well. There's a patch for it that lets you put a nice, pretty image up. When you boot up the Debian installer, you, know, you get a nice, pretty Debian logo, that kind of thing. That's all good and nice, but I don't want anything pretty. All I want is just a solid black screen, nothing going on. Um, I, I messed around with ways of making Grub look like the Windows boot up and things like that. and I found the most efficient thing was just hide Grub altogether. So you, set your, you, you create an image that's totally black. It's got to be a 640 by 480 image. Grub can't do anything bigger than that. Uh, it's got to be 14 color indexed, and it's got to be an XPM file. And you gzip that, put that in your Grub directory. You config Grub to use that. This, the actual syntax is all in the, in the slides. Um, and you also set all of your menus in Grub to be totally black. So when you boot it up, all, you totally black screen. The only way you're going to boot up your Linux install, press the down arrow. Press the down arrow, you boot up your stuff. By default, it's going to boot up the fake Linux install. And from there, boot up Qemu. You want to set the timer long enough that you can hit the arrow key and get to your install, but not so long that they're sitting there staring at a black screen for a long enough time to start getting suspicious, think there's something wrong with the machine or whatever. One of the things that helps us here is a lot of people are used to machines that are full of junk and take forever to boot up. They're probably going to be a little patient with the fact that their Windows is taking a little while to boot up and probably not think anything real weird is going on. The next thing that we want, obviously, once you get past Grub, you boot up Linux, so you got all kinds of messages that are scrolling by. Maybe our attacker just thinks, oh, well, this is some kind of DOS stuff or whatever, but we'd rather not have them see that. Um, that's where the Boot Splash project comes in. That, if you have used SUSE, they use it. A lot of the commercial distros use it to make their boot up look nice and slick. That's the stuff where when you boot up, press F2 to see all of the messages. If you don't press it, you see a little lizard animation, whatever Susie has, whatever your distro has. What we're going to do, though, is um, make that look like Windows. You create an, an animation that's supported by the boot splash, just like they created their little lizard, except ours, in my case, Windows 2000, the simple little white screen with the very basic animation going across the bottom, which sometimes will go on for a very, very long time. This is going to go on while the Linux kernel is, is booting up. So they're not going to see any messages. They're also not going to see press F2 to do anything with this. They're just going to see what looks like the, the Windows boot up. And, and there's, uh, on the slides, there's more technical details as far as the syntax and things. Um, the technical details really aren't the important thing here, though, so much as the concept of what we're doing, in, in my opinion. I mean, it's, uh, the information is easy to find as far as the the technical nitty gritty um, in, in all the slides. For, for the user, for the um, boot splash, you have to patch your kernel. Um, it works best with the 2.6 kernels. And you need their user space utilities to make it work. And you need to take the time to create your own little animation, which I will put mine up on the website. It's not there right now, but 
it will be up there. Um, beyond this, um, what we have is, so we need to set up QMU. If you're not familiar with QMU, QMU is basically, it's, it's like VMware, virtual PC, those kinds of products, difference being it's, it's open source for the most part and free. Um, so within your distro, in Debian app, get it, down, download the source, compile it, again, easily available. Once you have it installed, you are going to create a Windows image. And in my case, I've made like a four gig image. The nice thing about the image is you create a four gig image, you're not immediately sucking up four gigs of your hard drive. You'll have the ability to use four, no more than four gigs. It's going to be used up as you fill up that Windows OS. So you know, you're kind of containing the damage that can be done there too. Um, you, you, can, you, bu you boot up QMU, the syn syntax is in the slides. Um, boot up QMU to boot off your CD-ROM, boot off an ISO for a Windows installer, wh whichever you choose to, to have available. Boot it up, do your standard Windows install, and as mentioned, try to fill it with fun, tasty stuff for your attacker. Financial documents, passwords, whatever seems like it will keep them there for you. Again, be creative. You know, the more that you've got there, the more time you put into it, the more time they will hopefully spend there and not spend wiping your drive. Within your Linux partition, this, this, the new slim partition we created just for the purposes of this, you need to make an addition to your startup scripts, however your distro does so, to boot up, um, I'm sorry, to boot up QMU and the Windows image within QMU as early as we can within the process and have that be booting up while we've got our little Windows stuff going by. This is go there is going to be a seeming glitch to the user where they're going to have been seeing a Windows animation, black screen will flash by, and then they're going to see the real Windows startup. My experience is the kind of person who's probably going to run off with my laptop and try and put it on eBay, you know, and not know what Linux is that I was worried about in the first place probably is not going to think much about that glitch. It could probably be done better, but for, for our purposes, I, I think it will work. And we also want to add entries to our startup scripts on the um, new Linux install to watch what's going on, adder cap, snort, whatever it is you'd like to run to watch the network activity. The idea is basically log what they're doing, look for anything that's interesting, just like you would on, on any other network, and have the script look to see if it is connected to the internet, and if it is, send that information back to us as often as possible. If we're lucky, maybe they'll be on dial-up, we'll get their phone number, maybe we'll get the logins to their Gmail account, who knows? It's, you know, it's, it's kind of a crapshoot, but we're basically, we're hoping to just improve our chances of getting lucky. And, oh, and what I don't, I think I skipped past. No, I didn't. Set up Grub to make sure the first entry in Grub is the fake Linux install that boots up Windows. Second entry is our real Linux install. So all our, all our stuff is still here. We're just going to take up, at the most, another four or five gigs of the hard drive um, set aside for these purposes. If you've got a decent sized hard drive, that's not that much. If you want to be modest about it, you could probably do Windows 2000 and your, and your Slim Linux and everything. You know, in, in just a couple of gigs. Um, you know, I'm just trying to be on the safe side with the five. As far as the downsides to all this, it's there's there's a lot of work going on here to do all this. Um, <coughs> is it worth your time? Probably not. Um, there's a lot of inconvenience here. Um, a lot of time and effort put in this for basically hoping to get lucky. You know, we're, we're pretty much just crossing our fingers. And realistically speaking, there's a good chance that somebody that steals my laptop is not even going to put it on the internet in the first place. They're going to take it home, maybe boot it one time, maybe just immediately take out the hard drive and, and reformat it or, or try to boot off a CD or whatever, whatever method they prefer to do to try and get the thing ready to put on eBay. We're hoping to get lucky. The upside is we might get our laptop back. Yeah, this is a whole lot of work and it's kind of a contrivance, but if you, you know, got yourself in a debt spending $3,000 on a laptop, 
this might be worth your time because if you don't do something like this and you get your laptop lost or stolen, your chances are pretty much zero that you're going to get it back. Um, this won't necessarily guarantee it, but it improves your chances slightly. That's the advantage to it. For my $500 laptop, debatable. If I had a $3,000 power book, it gets a lot more attractive. As far as the conclusion from all this, it's, it's a concept. Everything I have, I have methods here on how you can do this. I definitely don't think it's the most perfect way to do this, but it's a concept. I, I, I just felt like a lot of people weren't really thinking in this direction. You know, I, I, I think I've been really guilty about it myself. Just nobody really cares what's on my laptop. Nothing's very important. It's all a lot to anybody else, just uninteresting stuff. But the hardware itself might be worth something to them, and nobody really thinks about that or really spends any time really worrying about how they get it back. That's something I like to see more of. I'd like to see people take what I've got here and make it better, make it a more realistic procedure of doing this, which I know can be done, um, and just thinking more in this direction. That's, that's basically what I'm aiming for uh, to get out of this. Um, and I'm, I'm going to work on that myself, perfecting this a little bit more, getting it a little bit more slick, and, and, and for people that are less familiar with some of the stuff that's going on, I'm going to put up in detail the syntax, the actual specifics of how you would do every little step. A lot of that's in the slides that are already up there. Um, it could be outlined a lot more and a few more things probably scripted so somebody that's not really familiar with some of these technologies, it could get a lot easier for them. Um, but at, at the moment this is something where you're, you're going to be fairly familiar with a lot of this stuff if you're going to try it. If you're somebody that's never compiled a kernel, you're probably going to be a little scared of some of this stuff. And that pretty much covers my slides. I would have a little bit different at that. I don't know if anybody would agree with me. I mean, for if I was going to steal it, I would get the hard drive, but I'd image the drive and then I'd low level it and then pick through the image. And you're susceptible that way because if I image your drive, I'm going to not only see the Windows partition, I'm going to see your Linux partition too. Right. You're absolutely right. But the point here, I guess I shouldn't have said if somebody here at the con steals my, my laptop. <laughs> Any, if, if anybody in this room runs off with my laptop, they're going to do those kinds of things. The average person that's, if I'm in an airport, if I'm in a coffee shop, you know, the, the likelihood of you being around your fellow geeks when your laptop goes missing is slim. The likelihood of you being around some random person who knows he can sell that at a pawn shop or on eBay and really knows very little about computers other than they're expensive, that's a lot more likely, I think. So you're absolutely right. This is absolutely not protecting you from any kind of technical attacks. Yeah, I, and again, I could encrypt you know, everything that's on that partition, you know, all the kinds of technical things to protect it. I'm not trying to protect myself from a technical attacker. I'm trying to protect myself from an idiot that can put it on eBay. The whole idea is, Nobody cares what's on my hard drive. They want to sell my hard drive. I'd also have to disagree with you on the fact that you said that you think that your hardware is valuable. I think anybody that knows anything knows damn well that your data is a million times more valuable than the, than the actual body can ever be. I mean, I'd be more worried about the data getting compromised than I would be about the hardware. I can only go buy it on a $500 freaking crap laptop to run. But if, if I was writing something, then I would be really upset that. But I, I, I agree those are fair points. I'd be upset if my laptop was gone and I had to buy a new one. Um, and again, the point is, what if I spent a lot more than 500 bucks on it? Yeah, mine's kind of worthless. What about the guy with, with brand new MacBook? You know, or the, the guy with the $3,000 Alienware that with the dual processors or whatever. I guess oh. the point I'm getting to is that I feel my time is worth a lot more money than your laptop. Than the, the lap, man hours on the laptop you're to get. I mean, it's just hard. Oh, that's, that's a fair argument. For, for me, I, I, I feel like my hardware is worth something. 
not a whole lot to other people, but to me. Uh, and my data that's actually on here, anything important I don't really keep on my laptop. Anything somebody's going to get, you know, I'm mostly out the hardware, I guess is what I'm saying. If you're keeping your whole life on your laptop and it goes missing, then yeah, that data is worth a lot more to you. I see a lot of people buying laptops and computers in very ghetto ways, you know, like, you know, I, I went to see a car mechanic and he had, you know, like $2,000 Sony Vio. I'm like, how'd you get that? Fell off the back of a truck, you know. Um, I have friends that, you know, almost strictly buy things in like pawn shops and stuff. You know, that, this is how those things get there. Um, there are a lot of people out there that, you know, I don't think, that there, there certainly is an issue with data and with legitimately people stealing your identity, things like that off your laptop. But I mean, you know, if you're, are, if you're, it sounds like you're, you're maybe a developer or something, if you're working on some kind of computer program, that's on your laptop, the average person takes it, doesn't know what that is. They might know what to do with your financial documents. They aren't going to see the value in the code that you're writing. It's valuable to you, and it's you know, valuable to who you're writing it for. But the average person doesn't see the value in it. That's kind of my point, I guess. Hey, Omar, could you actually have your laptop turn itself on and call home? Turn itself on? Yeah, because that was one of the things I mentioned is if you got this, Hope that they turn it on and hook it up to the internet. Yeah, I, that I'm, I'm, I'm making, I, I am making a couple of leaps, leaps of faith there. I am hoping they turn it on. I'm hoping they connect to the internet. What I'm hoping for is to make it more likely that they do so and keep it connected. I, I can't force them to press the power button on my laptop. Well, like, there might be a way to like, with the wake up land and all that yeah, stuff that's out there now. Could you do something with wake up? Yeah, but as he but as the thief throws in the car and is driving somewhere and it picks up a signal depending on how, uh, how long he's sitting somewhere. If it boots on, on land and then sends a signal out, you can get it before he's even back. Yeah. Yeah, I... One of the commercials <laughs> that came out was uh, Guardian Angel by Robert Urich, the guy that was on what TV show. No one here is young enough to know. Robert Urich? Okay. You know what? What was the TV show he did? Nah, you're fucked up. But anyway, but he did come out with a product called Cyber Angel. And it was something that you load on your machine that whenever you fired it up, it started beaconing. Unless you went over the back. Yeah, do you have a do you have a back end like server script or you know like whatnot? Back end server that like if you do start beaking this stuff, that somehow it'll either start feeding you the IP address information or screenshots or something, so you can figure out where this person is. That that honestly, I saw that as being the trivial part. You know, if I've got an internet connection, you know, I could tell it, I could tell it, email it to me. I can tell it to you know SSH to somewhere, SCP files somewhere. I mean, connect to a web server. I mean, there's. And again, I'm assuming, you know, again, that the firewall that they're behind is not particularly restrictive. If it is, then that's a whole other subset of pretty much telling my script to run the gamut of possible ways it could get out of their network, you know, and get back to me. I, I saw that as a solved problem, you know. It's plenty of things you can script there. Data on right. I mean, if you're going to have port 80 open anyways on most browsers, I don't know why you would block off web access like that. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's highly unlikely they, they wouldn't have a lot of things like that open. But yeah, I was wondering if you could make your power management and just write a script so it, it turns on every hour, calls on, and turns off. That, yeah, that, that's so something that could be done. Yeah, that, that would make more sense. I agree with that, yeah. That that I actually hadn't thought about. That that might be something that would make a little more sense. Fires up like a possessed demon and starts trying to. You hear the click click and constantly connect to the telephone line. And I mean that would immediately tip me off. Something seriously screwed up. And we'll have to see what access points they're connecting to. What MAC address that that wireless card has that's built into there? I mean, you can 
somehow query that information and say, hey, here was that past scene? Yeah, I mean, you don't need like a vectoring traceback program to figure out exactly where that person's coming from. You can figure it out on your own, but you have to do a lot of work to get there. My friend had a laptop, so we actually went around. Did you find it? That, that's an interesting idea too, and 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 you also you get like the last few access points that they've seen cached. So yeah, like you're saying, if you could, if you were able to get at that and query Wiggle, you know that yeah that that could actually go a lot farther to finding them. And I don't believe Wiggle stores client information like just access points. So that really well, no, the last few access points. Like if you you ever do that when you run up kids, Matt? And you, you start to pick up wacky stuff like, why am I picking this up? And it's whatever you were looking at, right. you know, the last time you were connected. You know, they get cached. Those, you know, that, that, stuff, that stuff would be in Wiggle, possibly, the last few access points they connected to. Hi, yeah. From somebody who might be mildly familiar with Wiggle, but I Right, well, no, I, I, I agree with that, too. For that, if you did this in a production environment, this would be a, a support nightmare. This is not a practical thing for the average Why user. Why don't we make a Windows service that does this, rather than have it with... Because I'm not a Windows guy. But absolutely, you probably... If, if, if it's possible to have a Windows service boot up and automatically run something in emulation and all that stuff... Um, that'd be, that'd be a lot easier thing. than running an alternate emulator and making the, Yeah, that's you, do a lot. you you don't yeah, you would you don't have to do it that way. I was doing it that way for the purpose of abstracting things a little bit more from them and having the ability to log really easily underneath. And and because I'm a Linux guy, my interest was in protecting protecting my Linux laptop that I thought I really had protected from something it's really not protected from. Um, for a Windows laptop uh, that you actually, you know, that you primarily want to run Windows on, you're going to attack it in a different way. And if you actually have users that are running Linux on a, on a large scale, you would want to make it easier. And, you know, rather than what I did where you have a black screen and where you just see absolutely nothing, you know, you, you could possibly do something that's a little user friendlier. Um, I mean, the, the, the thing about it is you want it to automatically, if for it to work, it has to automatically go into the fake stuff if you don't know what to do. And that alone is what's going to create your support nightmare. Because if your user forgets to, you know, enter in their password, hit the key at the right time, whatever, they're going to be in, you know, in this whole little trap that we've set, which is going to drive you nuts with support calls. Yeah, that, I don't know that it makes sense for that in a large scale. Um, what if there's a Windows service that's always running on Say your computer's on your network, and you know if it is connected to your real network, you know I can check that out and then don't log all that stuff. But if it's not, then yeah, log all that stuff, phone home. I mean, and and you know the, the the thing you're doing there though is what I was trying to avoid was something where, an, a, while I don't think I have a sophisticated attacker, I don't want them to very obviously be able to see that there's something going on. I don't want to do anything to make them suspicious. Right. Maybe they're sophisticated enough to run task manager, you know, if I have something as obvious as, you know, VNC is running in the system tray, they might notice that. Um, honestly, for the I, person I had in mind, the guy who's stealing my laptop and putting it in a pawn shop, that probably would fly anyways. I, I mean, that's exactly what the, the thing I read about was. Somebody had Timbuk2 running on their laptop. It must, you know, it's got a little icon and everything. It's not like it's hard to figure out the software is installed and that it's running. But the attacker did not notice this. This person dialed into their machine, you know, got all kinds of information, and was able to track it down. So I was basically trying to take what happened by accident and improve upon it so the attacker wouldn't see that this stuff was going on, if, even if they did look. They probably wouldn't, but, you know, not taking the chance. I think you'd be better off 
having a Windows solution under Windows and a Linux solution under Linux because you could pretty easily hide it. Or Windows just use the Sony root kit. <laughs> no, that, that's, a, that's a really good point, actually. But under Linux, for instance, um, if you had like a, a KDE desktop, most Windows users can figure out how to launch a web browser or something, or a few games on desktop. You have like a KDE uh, login manager, have a couple icons with usernames they click on, there's no password they get in, where the real user isn't on the list, they have to type their username in and a password, that's an encrypted partition, or encrypted home folder. So. It would log in, it looked like it was an unsecured family laptop, and they would get in and be able to mess around. Meanwhile, you got scripts running at root level there. Have, you know, have you ever had a family member who's not a computer person try to use your Linux desktop? It's simple as KDE seems. I have a 60 some odd year old mother. My, I'm, and I've had some people that catch on to things really well, and some people that don't, but in my mind, it's something where a lot of people, it's not what I'm used to seeing, and they freak out, and okay, well, you know. I don't know what to do with this. And you could, and you could skin KDE to look like Windows, you know. And you you could skin, you know. There's like a KDE default boot splash and stuff. Right. He doesn't have to click on it. Just has to wait long enough for you to log log out on a nearby access point somewhere and. Well, but I want him to stay on there a long time, though. I want him to stay on there a long time so I have a better chance of getting it. Right. You know, the more information I have, the yeah. higher my chances go. If you know, if it's something where he boots it up and I don't know what this is and none of this looks familiar, um, let me you know, let me shut this down. And, you know, that, I, I think that increases the chances I'm not going to get it back. Um, I, I absolutely agree that there's lots of inefficiencies in the way I'm doing this. But like I said, I wa I was hoping to get some wheels turning as far as, like you said, if you can take the concept and do it totally in Windows and make it work for, for Windows users, fantastic. I just, I don't think enough people really think about the fact that a lot of people are interested in the hardware. Yeah, identity theft is a really big problem and getting really a lot bigger, but um, hardware costs money too. So I guess what I'm saying here is we need to make sure thief has a good out of the box experience. Yes, exactly. Anybody else? <coughs> Have you thought of a, I know you're real like bent on the whole hardware thing, which is reasonable, but um, like when they boot up the fake Windows, the Linux partition that's running underneath them, have you ever thought about doing anything with your data, your real data on the other drive, like have it just start wiping it out or tarring it up and doing something with it, like encrypting it, like um, like while it's happening? I, ideally, if this is a laptop I'm going to expect to be out in the wild and this might happen to, I'm going to encrypt my real data. You know, again, I can take all the precautions I want. I can encrypt all the data that's on there. You know, I can set permissions very restrictively. You know, install all the typical security stuff. The whole point is, if that's what it boots into, and they see a, a Linux login prompt like you normally get on my laptop, that you know that's text and everything, they're gonna go, "What is this?" They're gonna fumble around a few times trying to log in, not get logged in. I say, "Okay, I'm gonna turn this off," and, and you know, zap, zap the, the the CMOS if they know how to do that pull out the hard drive, you know, depending on their sophistication. I mean, like, alongside of what you have already running. Like, say Windows is already running, and then the Linux thing underneath is doing stuff with your real data. Like Ideally, I don't want to touch that data. Oh, okay. If I wanted to protect it, I'd encrypt that, and I want that fake Windows, not the fake Linux, not to touch it whatsoever. I just want to pretend like it's not there. You're right, I, I could have something that's set up so it crons and it boots up, and if a period of time goes by, it starts just, you know, deleting all that data. Or maybe, you know, have D-Band just destroy everything on the entire drive, including the fake Windows at some point. That's a possibility. But if I actually do care about the data that's on there at all, well, it's one way you could do things. It's not that way I think I would want to do it. But depending on how you care, I mean, if you're really paranoid about the fact of anything getting in somebody else's hands and you think your encryption is, is crackable, yeah, maybe that's something to try. People do make those. They have wireless now, so. They're also, my understanding is the things like that that are out there that are expensive, and I don't know that they necessarily work that well. Yeah, yeah. If, if, you, if you can get a laptop that has GPS built in already, 
that's going to make th this job easier too, you know. So again, I'm, I'm relying on them to turn on my laptop, but if all I have to do is worry about them turning on my laptop and the GPS coming on, you know, and having some way to send the coordinates back to me, yeah, I'm going to find them a lot quicker. Um, the only system, what's that? It's, yes. Yeah, yeah. Unless they're in a metal building, Yeah, it definitely increases the chances. And, and if and if we're talking about it protecting expensive hardware, then you know maybe it's more likely we have something like that integrated. Um, but they're being to a hardware solution that can be on all the time at a low power level, so you don't have to worry about the system booting or do something. They can log it to like ROM um, or something, and then as soon as comes up and gets connected and dumps it out. Yeah, and, and especially if you have something that's really efficient on power, that, that becomes easier too. Um, yeah. I'm out of time? Yeah. Okay, I'm out of time. <laughs> <laughs>